The views shared on this podcast are those of Mike Sowers and do not represent those of Commercial Investors Group. The information shared is not investment advice. Please consult your financial, legal, and tax advisors before making an investment decision. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Mike Sowers, your host of the show. I don't know if you know this, but our company, Commercial Investors Group, is actually the only commercial investing franchise system in the entire world. And we're actually looking for partners in all major US markets. So a lot of people have been asking me about this franchise opportunity. So what I did is I put together a webinar that walks you through everything in full detail. Now, the reality is that this opportunity is only for people who are serious about making this happen for themselves now. And to qualify, you have to be really smart, you have to love crunching the numbers, you have to be very decisive, and you need to have a strong sense of urgency to accomplish your goals and make a real change in your life. So to get registered for this exclusive webinar, just head over to www.cre franchise.com and as a bonus just for attending i'm going to throw in a free audio copy of my book as well as some of my coolest deal analyzer tools that's www.crefranchise.com we'll see you in there hey, hey welcome to another show of the creative commercial real estate podcast and i'm super excited today to have steven pesavento on the show steven is a multifamily syndicator and uh, just a, a great guy. He has a lot of energy and he has a lot to bring to the topic of uh, syndication. And today's episode is really geared towards people who haven't been able to decide if they want to be an active or passive investor. And really, if you decide you want to be a passive investor, uh, what are the things that you need to know in order to get your money put to work in these real estate deals safely? There are two kinds of people in the world. Those that worry sharing their ideas will hinder their success and those who are driven by the success of others. The first kind view everyone as a competitor. They guard their playbook tight to their chest, rarely collaborate outside their inner circle, and are reluctant to show their cards. Then there are the second kind, the kind who have graduated from the first category. They don't count the number of deals they've done. What counts to them is the number of people they impact and the depth to which they impact them. Achievement is still important to them, but it's subordinated to the depth of their purpose. So they give freely of their time, knowledge, and expertise to build a bridge for those who follow in their footsteps. These are the people who were called to change the world. These are the people who develop people, places, and ideas. And this is the show where they do it on the Creative Commercial Real Estate Podcast. So welcome to the show, Stephen. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to dive in. I love uh, love what you're doing. Yeah. So before we jump into the topic for today, Stephen, uh, why don't you just tell me a little bit about yourself and and how you how you got into real estate investing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, born and raised in Minneapolis, uh, graduated from St. John's, and you know, after a career in management consulting, I kept looking back and thinking to myself, "Hey, there's got to be something that's a little bit more passionate than what I'm doing today." You know, people were really excited about what they're working on and creating something that's bigger and better, and so I kind of went on this journey. I went on this path first to technology in the startup world, and then eventually found my way to real estate. It took me nearly 10 years since I read that little purple book, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, to finally get my first deal. But when I dove uh, you know, head first in, uh, I jumped right into uh, buying and fixing and flipping houses. Uh, and we had bought over 75 houses that first year and flipped over 200 uh, within about a two and a half year period. And uh, did that back in Minneapolis and uh, also out in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm based out of Denver, uh, but I've always had a remote business. And that actually really led me down the path of realizing like we've scaled this business and we're seeing a lot of success. We're having a lot of fun doing it, but it's difficult to you know build a scaled uh, empire on single family. And that's what really opened my eyes to commercial and uh, really opened my eyes to multifamily and syndication. And so we made the pivot and uh, haven't looked back. And one of the big reasons that we decided to go that path was really because we we're passionate about working with a specific kind of person. You know, in the single family world, we're buying houses directly from homeowners, you know, for 60, 70 cents on the dollar. Uh, and, you know, we're going out and, you know, we're solving a major problem in their world and they're grateful for it, but they're really in a survival mindset versus 
being able to surround myself with other entrepreneurs, other business owners, other successful people who really believe that life can be better, that we can grow, that we can create freedom and flexibility. And that's what really attracted me to syndication was the fact that I got to work with incredible people who are making a great income and want to find a way to, uh, to be able to do that hands off. And, and that's really how, what we do started. You know, I, I run a podcast called investor mindset, one of the top ranked investing podcasts where we dive into, you know, both mindset of investing, how to think about this, how to grow, how to think successfully, but also how do you really get started leveraging some of the tools that the ultra wealthy have, uh, have been using for, for decades. And, and, uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. Nice. Well, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a great background. Um, so let's dive into the topic. Uh, let's talk about passive investing. So let's say that uh, in, in our audience is, is everybody from beginners on to expert investors. Um, but I think there's a fair amount of people who are just kind of getting started in this game, right? And they're trying to figure out uh, whether they want to be the deal sponsor or a passive investor in these syndications. Why don't you start off by just defining what is a syndication? Yeah, that's such a good, good question. We talk a lot about this on Investor Mindset, but one of the things that's important to understand is syndication is just a fancy $2 word for a group investment. It's essentially where there's an operator or a sponsor, also known as the general partner. This is the person who's going to go and buy the deal and sign on the loan and really put everything together and make those day-to-day -day decisions. And then there's the other side, there's the passive investor, aka the limited partner, uh, aka the capital provider. And that person is going to put up the capital. They're going to invest their money, but they're going to be uh, in a position where they don't need to make those decisions day to day. And they actually are uh, limited in their liability to that initial investment. So what's actually being created in a syndication is what's called a security. It's the same thing you'd invest in when you're investing in the stock market, but it's with real estate and it's private. So you have to know the sponsors. You have to have some connection to them or, you know, find them through, you know, internet or, you know, through some podcasts or something like that to have an opportunity to invest. It's not something that's available on the stock exchange. So uh, it's important to understand that, you know, when you're in this group investment, what it really comes down to is the power of partnership right? The, the syndicator, the sponsor, that operator, for all of you operators out there, you know, this is true. There's a huge value in working with a passive investor and it's the same the other way. It's really a symbiotic relationship. The passive investor has capital. They're making amazing money in their career. They've saved up money in their retirement account, but they want to start leveraging the power of real estate, but they don't want to become a real estate expert. They don't want to go out and do the work or take the time to be responsible for doing all those things. So they invest with a sponsor. And for the sponsor, it's beneficial. And the reason why sponsors love to do this is because it allows them to leverage uh, the, the power of partnership to be able to leverage the economies of scale by going out and buying bigger properties than they would on their own. And together, everybody wins. The sponsors you know, get paid based on alignment of interest. They're really making their money based on the success of the project. Of course, they get fees um, just to keep the lights on. But majority of the upside from those deals is typically coming as a result of those investors doing really well. Um, and that's that's essentially what a syndication is. Wow, you, you laid that out so clearly. And uh, I, I think that one of the points there that really stood out to me is the fact that it is a symbiotic relationship. Because oftentimes I have coaching students who come to us and they just cannot wrap their head around the idea that somebody would want to invest their money with them. So yeah. I, and I think that that really is founded in that they don't understand the mindset of the limited partner, right? They don't mm -hmm. understand that those people have money they want to invest and that they, if they want to get involved in real estate, but do it in a passive way, that syndications are a great way to do that. So what would you say to the deal sponsor who has a mental block about their ability to raise capital. Like a yeah. new, I'm a new deal sponsor. I, I don't think I'll be able to raise capital. How would you inspire that person? Yeah, it's such a good question, right? And it really starts with psychology, right? It, it, the investor mindset, right? How do I get into the mindset of the investor? What does that person want? What do they desire? What are they really after? And, and me as the sponsor, what am I really after? What do I desire? Why is this important? And why is this valuable? And we can start from that place of understanding what the value exchange that's happening is. We can really understand what the motivation is. And then we can understand why someone would actually want to go down this path and they're going to end up investing as a result. And so the investor, what they're often looking for is they're looking to start benefiting from all the benefits that real estate offers from cash flow to appreciation to the ability to use leverage, 
to the ability to uh, you know, hold on to a physical asset, to be hedged against inflation, and of course, uh, the tax benefits that are available passively and the tax benefits that are even better if you happen to be a real estate professional that really only real estate offers. So all of those things are huge and a huge benefit to that investor, um, but what's really below that? right? That's where it really gets important from a marketing and a psychology standpoint is those investors are looking for more time. They're looking for more freedom and flexibility. They're looking to spend time with their family. They're looking to have more fun. They're looking to have more certainty to know that the investment they're making is going to end up leading them to not losing their money as well as having growth. And some of those investors are looking for rapid or uh, you know, big growth in their portfolio. And maybe they're not seeing that in the stock market or maybe in the stock market, they're starting to realize. And what the truth is that the, the stock market, the returns versus the risk is weighted in the opposite direction as you might see in real estate, and especially in multifamily real estate, but across all asset classes, that's true. And so when we can come from that perspective as a sponsor, we can look at how are we going to communicate in a way that it ends up allowing this, this uh, investor to understand what the benefit is for them. And then we can also change our mindset, our way of thinking, right? And mindset is simply just our thoughts and beliefs and how those thoughts and beliefs end up leading directly into the actions that we take and therefore the outcomes we experience. And by changing those thoughts and beliefs, we can end up changing the actions and therefore changing how we show up. So in this instance, in this case, by understanding the investor, by asking questions, by getting to know the situation, personally experiencing what they're really looking for, uh, we can recognize that this is actually extremely valuable, that it's very difficult to find these kinds of deals and opportunities, that the world we live in as a deal sponsor is a very small world, and that majority of people are not even aware of syndication or investing in commercial real estate or the ability to do so, let alone knowing where to start or how to build that trust with a sponsor. So when you can be that person to answer the questions and to be able to simplify these complex topics the same way I'm doing right here, you can be in a position that it's really gonna attract those people. And remember, people invest with people. They're, they may look at the deal and they may care about the return, but they're gonna invest with you as the sponsor because of the relationship you're able to build. And that's a feeling. Right. And so when you can understand what are they actually looking for, that changes the conversation so that I can talk about how, as an investor, you're going to you're going to be totally hands off. This is something we're going to handle everything from day one to the end. You get to leverage our expertise, our experience, our relationships. And as a bonus, you're going to receive, you know, over 50 percent of the upside or, you know, 80 percent of the upside, depending on what that split looks like um, on the deal. It can be very advantageous for the investor. And so when they realize like, wow, I'm really the one who's getting the better deal here. I'm surprised the sponsor wants to make this kind of offer. It comes from a place of this is an opportunity versus this is me asking for a favor. That's really big. Yeah. Wow. That's so huge. That, that last jab that you threw in there is, is really the mindset um, shift that needs to happen, I think, for a lot of first timers is they don't realize that they're the, uh, in my book, I call it the hot chick at the bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it's the fact that um, they're bringing something to the table. They're not asking something. Mm. You know, they're not taking. And so changing that mindset, I think is huge. And that's one of the reasons I love your podcast is, is uh, you know, thinking begets actions and actions uh, ultimately uh, determine the, the lifestyle that you live and and all of that so it all plays together so let's talk about playing off of that let's talk about okay now you've decided you want to be a passive investor what uh do you need to know about how to bet a deal sponsor yeah this is so this is so important so i'm going to answer that but i'm going to i'm going to add a little bit of something that i think is really helpful for people right and so we hear this idea of active versus passive right and it's very simple, right? An active investor is the operator. They're the ones who are going out and doing all that work. Passive investor, they're the ones who are sitting back and they're investing their capital. So once we're clear on which one we want to be and which one best aligns with our goals, uh, then it can be really simple. But a lot of us don't take that time getting clear on what we want and why we want it. So get clear on what do you actually want. You want to create that return. You want that upside. You want the freedom and flexibility. Why do you want it? Oh, because we we want to spend more time with our family. We want to go up to the cabin. We want to be able to own a cabin. We want to be able to have more fun. We want to be able to not worry about what's going on with our family's finances. Whatever those reasons are, that's going to help you understand 
what you're actually looking for. And then that's going to lead you to this next place, which is answering the question, what is the specific type of return profile that I'm looking for? Am I looking for cash flow? Am I looking for equity growth or appreciation? Or am I looking for a hybrid of the two? Or, or potentially, am I looking for something that has really great tax advantages? Most of the opportunities we have at Von Finch Capital do. And I'm sure most of the ones that you do as well. So I really focus on those first three. And so if you're somebody who's looking to live off the capital as a passive investor, um, and you're looking for that cash flow, then you're going to want to find opportunities that are cash flow focused. Or if you're somebody who doesn't need the money, you're making amazing money in your career, maybe it's 10, 15, 20 years down the line that you're going to actually start living off of it. You have a, a risk profile that you're comfortable with medium to high risk. You're comfortable having the potential to lose principal. Um, uh, then you might take something that you're, you're comfortable going into something that might have a little bit more risk because you know over the long run, you're going to see that growth um, and it's going to really pay off. And you might go down the capital growth path. Or you might be somebody like me who is more like medium risk, I like cash flow because I like to see income coming in from day one or consistently, but I really overall care most about the growth that's going to happen overall, right? And that's more of a hybrid approach. So when we're clear on this, then we can go out to start building relationships with great sponsors like yourself and like myself with Von Finch Capital. And when you're doing that, what I like to start with, and one of the key things of our business is that we really believe in partnerships. So we'll partner with the passive investor. We'll partner with you guys who are looking to invest. And, um, but we also partner with other experts in those areas, right? When we're investing out of state and we're investing in a new market, we're really going to look to align our interests with an operator with a decade of experience who can execute together with us, but bring that expertise to the table. So we're doing this due diligence ourselves every single day. So I can share a little bit about what that looks like. But at the core, I always believe it starts with people. It's the same conversation I have when I vet an investor. If you guys are interested, you can head to vonfinch.com slash invest and apply to invest. And what happens is we dive into a conversation where I'm asking you questions about who you are as a person what you're looking to invest in, what's important to you. And in that conversation, I'm vetting and doing due diligence. Are you the kind of person who I'm going to want to work with? Are you kind? Are you a jerk? Are you asking for things that are reasonable or you know crazy things? Whatever it is, no problem. But that's what you want to do with an operator up front. You want to really get to know them. What is their communication style? What are their values? Have they dealt with uh, loss in the past? Have they lost money? I've, I've lost money on some deals, uh, in my career, you know, after flipping 200 houses, you'd expect there to be a couple that, you know, evened out those big wins. Um, but when you have that, what it ends up leading you to is you end up learning how you deal with that. And so what I like to do is I like to really get to know that operator on a personal level and a professional level at the same time. So by getting clear on how they communicate and does that align up with mine? So when I'm working with an operator, I like the communication to flow easily. I want to know that they are going to respond to me within 24 hours so that I can always be able to provide answers back to people very, very quickly. And, you know, other operators are on a seven day, you know, they're going to respond to you next week, right? And so you have to understand what's important to you first, so that when you're having these conversations, you can set those boundaries in your mind of making the decision. Well, I like a lot of the things and I like the deals they're doing, but I don't know if they align perfectly with me, or I don't know if I agree with this philosophy of how they deal with challenge. So I think I'll just pass. And that's one of the biggest things that I can recommend to people is that don't feel like you have to make an investment. Feel like this is a no brainer. And sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll caveat that by saying some of the reasons people don't make action is because they're not clear and they have fear. And so I encourage you to jump and do it uh, if you, if it's just a fear thing, if that's, what's holding you back. Cause then on the other side, you're going to learn a lot, but if it's really like a gut feeling like this doesn't feel right, then I encourage you not to invest. So, um, I'll, I'll pause here in just a second. But the other thing that I recommend doing when you're talking to these sponsors is I like to look at track record. I like to look at what kind of deals the team has closed, what that track record looks like and what kind of information they can share with me about that. Why is that important? Because the same reason we go out and you know, bring on expert partners with nearly a decade of experience in the markets we operate in is because it's so important to know the individual little details that happen in that area. And so we bring that to the table into our relationships. And I'd encourage that you guys invest 
and look for operators that have some experience. You know, even like Mike here, he's experienced the Minneapolis market. He knows it. This is his area. And so he's able to leverage that experience. That's going to help uh, have a higher likelihood of success on those deals. So those are a couple of things. I've got a couple more questions we could talk through, but I want to pass it back over to you, Mike, to see if you have anything to add. No, that's great. So, so what I heard from you was basically asking the right questions to get to know the people more on a personal level and see if there's a good gut feeling there. And then seeing uh, what their track record is and looking at uh, that. Let's talk a little bit about specifics about the, the deal splits and stuff like that. How do you analyze if the offering is fair beyond the people? Let's say you're comfortable with the people. Now, how do you figure out if the offering is fair? Yeah, very good question, right? So I always start with the people and then it comes down to the deal, uh, you know, and the market and the details about that, right? So assuming the market is one that has growth, that there's population and job growth, there's stability, um, you know, the crime is reasonable, the, 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 these little details about having job growth and population growth are pretty important. So we look for that. But assuming all of these things are good, um, and that the operator's smart and that they're experienced. So they're choosing a great market to operate in and they're choosing a great deal. You'd assume that you're going to be in a good place. But then what I look to is the actual opportunity itself. And so I want to make sure that the return profile matches what I'm looking for. Now, let's be clear. Some investors are quite happy making a 12% or 10% return. It's phenomenal. It could blow some people out of the water. They happen to like those. They feel like those are great. You know, maybe they like a preferred return or a high preferred return or pref equity situation can be great. Other investors are happy to take on a little bit more risk uh, and therefore share in the backside or the back end upside. And they're going to go for something with more of a split or a waterfall. And so whatever it is for you, you got to know what, what's right and then decide uh, so that you can start looking at these deals. And so assuming you're clear on that, you know what you're looking for. Um, there's no right or wrong way to split up a deal. I've seen deals that are aggressive that have, you know, uh, maybe one or two or 3%, 3% is kind of on the higher side, one or 2% acquisition fee, a one to 2% asset management fee, you know, a couple percent maybe for construction management. If it's a heavy redevelopment, I look at the fees to understand, well, are they reasonable and are they making majority of their income off the fees or are they making majority of their income off of the success of the project? My preference personally, I like to see, Oper operators and sponsors making majority of their money off of the success. And so I like to align myself and bring opportunities forward that fit my own core values. And so that's really important. Now I've seen deals that are 50, 50 splits right off the bat with no waterfall um, that are able to offer great returns to investors and people eat them up. They buy them up. I also know on the flip side, uh, you know, sponsors who are offering 80, 20 splits, 80% of it going to the, the investor. I don't think there's a right or a wrong, and there's definitely more complex waterfalls in between. But what I do think is important is to look at the returns and understand what is the return that's being projected and how do I feel about it? Is this, am I comfortable with this? And am I comfortable with the sponsor receiving uh, the amount of upside that they're receiving based on the results? So at the end of the day, I think that's important. Now, as a, as a investor, I like to see uh, waterfalls or splits that are uh, the sponsors are receiving more of the upside as the deal is, you know, being more and more successful. That way it really drives those aligned incentives, but I don't know that there's a right or wrong way. I'm curious, Mike, what do you think? Yourself? Yeah, no, it's crazy because we've literally structured our deals in all of those ways. So every deal is a little bit different. Sometimes we sell funds. Sometimes we're doing a straight split, no pref. Oftentimes we're doing a pref with a straight split after the pref. Um, and occasionally we do a multi-tier waterfall, which I do like the graduated incentive and them, how they kind of work like federal tax brackets, right? How the sponsor gets paid essentially more taxes as they deliver more income to their investors. Um, it just becomes a bit of an administrative nightmare <laughs> figuring out what the distributions are. So in the real world, it, it, it all looks great on paper, but it is a little bit harder to sell. So I would never do a waterfall structure if I was targeting mom and pop or those kinds of people, because I just think it's hard to explain and therefore it's hard to sell. Um, but when you're getting into your, you know, you're partnering with a fund or something like that, and it's a fund manager who can talk the talk like me and you are, and we understand what a waterfall is. And by the way, if you don't understand what a waterfall is, I apologize. 
Um, all a waterfall is, is a, a term for uh, how the splits get spread as you drop into different buckets. So usually as the returns become higher, you drop into different buckets and the splits change. I'd love to, I'd love to add a little bit of a visual there for people. So if you, if you think about it, when you hear the word preferred return, or you hear a waterfall, if you really visualize like buckets of water that are kind of lined up uh, uh, one after another, and after that preferred return, let's say it's an 8% preferred, that 8% preferred return, the bucket fills up with water, everything above the bucket flows over to the next the next uh, bucket on the waterfall. And so each time those buckets are filled, uh, it's flowing over to a new set of splits. And so if you visualize that, that the return is filling up the bucket and then each time it moves up, it's being split in a new way. It can be a little bit easier to understand because at the end of the day, it's just a, a way of splitting it up so that there's even more aligned interest as, as the deal's doing better and better. Hey, what's up everybody? It's Mike Sowers, your host of the show. I don't know if you know this, but our company, Commercial Investors Group, is actually the only commercial investing franchise system in the entire world. And we're actually looking for partners in all major US markets. So a lot of people have been asking me about this franchise opportunity. So what I did is I put together a webinar that walks you through everything in full detail. Now, the reality is that this opportunity is only for people who are serious about making this happen for themselves now. And to qualify, you have to be really smart, you have to love crunching the numbers, you have to be very decisive, and you need to have a strong sense of urgency to accomplish your goals and make a real change in your life. So to get registered for this exclusive webinar, just head over to www.cre franchise.com and as a bonus just for attending i'm going to throw in a free audio copy of my book as well as some of my coolest deal analyzer tools that's www.crefranchise.com we'll see you in there yeah that's exactly it so i, I guess it, it really depends i think on, for us on the size of deal are you guys pretty consistent with the structure that you're using across your deals to kind of simplify you know, having to redo your pitch deck and stuff, or how are you guys typically structuring them? And then our, my second question to that is when you do structure them, are you putting in a couple of different like shares? Like you might to be able to cater, you, you mentioned like, Hey, there's the people that are really dividend, you know, happy. And then there's the people here. Have you ever done an offering where you'll have like class A shares that are just like a straight 10, they get paid first though. And then you'll have like yep. a share after that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, it, it would be great if we just had one way that we did it every single time that would simplify our life and the investors' lives. But what we like to do is we like to uh, leverage whatever's going to be best for the deal. And so we will modify the, the, the waterfall or the split or the way that we're setting up these deals because um, you know, every deal, especially in this kind of market is different, especially in the multifamily space right now, it's very competitive. And so we're looking to be able to return, you know, anywhere from the low of a 14% all the way up to, you know, the mid to high teens for cash flowing properties and the high teens, low twenties for, um, for redevelopment or heavier value add type property. So they offer different types of return profiles. So the way that looks is, you know, we've used, uh, you know, waterfalls on our recent 288 unit that we just closed in Jacksonville, Florida, about a $30 million property. We, we had a, a waterfall uh, with a pref uh, that was also included. Um, and that was a great structure because it ended up leading to um, still some significant returns for investors, but it really put the incentive that we really got to bust our butts to be able to deliver in order to receive majority of our upside is coming, you know, later in that, in that waterfall. But we definitely do like to be able to offer two different shares of, uh, equity. And the reason for that is it can be a little bit more complex, but the benefit is that there is investors who prefer that dividend. There's those investors who prefer to make an 8% or a 10% preferred return. They get paid first. They're in a slightly uh, more conservative position because of where and who is getting paid uh, first, right? They're, the debt is getting paid first and then they're getting paid second. And then the equity investors are getting paid following that. Um, and then that also offers the opportunity for somebody to invest in the same deal and have different types of return profiles. So um, once people understand it, it can be pretty simple, but it does take a little bit of effort up front educating folks on, well, hey, why would I choose to do this versus that? And the answer is, it just depends on what you want. Sure. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, 
I actually, uh, I thought this might be helpful to show this. That's a phenomenal, uh, if you guys are watching on video, you can really see that waterfall structure here. Yeah, so this is a graphic we had made for the, our book that's uh, coming out here in July 27th, 2021. Um, and so I thought this might be cool to just share. It kind of shows that, that actual waterfall that you were talking about and how the operating cash from the deal comes in and then it kind of gets, uh, gets paid out. So in this case, the passive members are in dark gray here and then the deal sponsors in light gray. So basically the deal sponsor doesn't even get paid until they've delivered quite a bit of return to the investors. Uh, in this case, there's a preferred return. Um, and then that's how the kind of the deal splits change. So that was something we had. I, I felt like people were just struggling a little bit. Now here, again, this is just an example. I, I love your comment about there's no right way to do it because I feel like people talk so much about, um, you know, what's the right splits and, and all of that. And at the end of the day, the right split is the splits that everybody's happy with and to get the deal done. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. And that's the thing. Sometimes I'll, I'll notice uh, I've had conversations with investors, maybe past investors like you guys who are listening have thought this yourself and they, they look at a deal and they say, well, I wouldn't invest in a deal that had a 50, 50 split. You know, I recently was talking with someone really important to me and I looked at a deal they were investing in and I said, you know, hey, the, you know, I, I see the way that this is set up and I'm looking at it and I, I think it's phenomenal. I would love that, that type of a split. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the most important thing is to be happy with it yourself. There's nothing wrong with passing on a deal because it doesn't fit what you want. No need to complain about it. Definitely share the feedback with the sponsor so they understand what's going on. That's one of the, the biggest recommendations I can have as a passive investor is don't be a jerk. Um, be appreciative of the opportunity to invest because that's exactly what it is. And it can be pulled at any moment if you don't, if you don't align with those values, right? If you're not a, a good person. Um, but the other thing is that when you uh, are looking at a deal, especially if, you know, in this internet world where we're not meeting face to face, um, it's phenomenal to just be able to say, Hey, I looked at the deal. Here's what I liked about it. Here's what I didn't like about it, or I'm not liquid or now's not the right time. It's great to be able to share that feedback. The reason why is because the sponsor is able to see that you're interactive, you're engaging, you're somebody who wants to do deals. They know they're going to think of you in the future and probably give you some kind of opportunity or priority just because of the fact that you've been communicative during the process. So that's a big, big recommendation I have for people. Yeah, man, that's such great feedback because I feel like sometimes people out there, they, you know, when you start talking about money, they just, uh, their, their personality changes and it's like, just be a good person, you know, even if you're not going to invest that, that communication and, uh, and, uh, being able to communicate positively in a way that's not offensive, because I've had some people that take a pass on a deal and they, they, you know, they just stop taking my calls or whatever, because they talked to somebody else who maybe looked at a deal split and didn't understand the deal. And was just like, oh, I'd never do a deal that was a 50, 50 split or whatever. And they think I was trying to rip them off and they just don't answer my calls anymore. And then yeah. somebody else invested in that deal with 50, 50 split. And I gave them a 28% annualized return on their money and they're happy as you know, can be. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, does that ever happen to you where, where somebody else, their financial advisor, or whatever, will talk them out of some stuff. Actually, I want to ask you about that. How do you, um, the kind of the whole uh, team of advisors, how do you guys handle that on the front end? Because oftentimes we're, we're pitching to people and then they're like, their objections, I got to run it by my CPA or my attorney or whatever. Are you yeah. inviting those people to come on or are you doing one-on-ones or how are you guys handling that? Well, what's interesting about the way that we've set up our investment offerings is that these deals end up closing pretty quickly as far as from a capital perspective. So a lot of the time folks are getting educated in advance. They're learning about the, the types of offerings or the deals we do. They're answering and asking those questions up front. They're doing that due diligence before the deal so that they're able to make a decision within a short amount of time because they know what they're looking for. But however, I definitely have conversations with advisors, with CPAs, with attorneys. And what I found is that some advisors actually understand this stuff. One of the big things to understand though, as both a sponsor, as well as a passive investor is who, uh, what is the, what is your financial advisor's motivation? <laughs> if they work at Merrill Lynch or one of these large companies that exclusively invest in the stock market or in uh, funds or uh, projects that they're receiving fees on, 
Um, there's nothing wrong with fees, right? But you have to understand wh where does the money tie to? And so majority of those people at say Merrill Lynch or something like it, uh, there's plenty of other examples. I'm not picking on them. They just happen to be the one that comes to mind. Their incentive and they're trained to believe that only things that fit within this box can fit because that's what they're taught to sell. And that's the reason why majority of people invest in the stock market and mutual funds, because that industry has spent hundreds of billions of dollars teaching and training and persuading you to believe that's the only option. So if you're going to invest in real estate, you're going to have to know that some of the people around you do not yet have the information to really be able to help you make those decisions. And so it's important to understand that they're not bad. They just have a different understanding or belief. And so you have to be able to look at it and say, hey, I'm interested in investing in real estate. I see the writing on the wall. I understand the upside benefit, right? And let me just walk through a couple of those here and then I'll finish on, on that. I mean, the upside is that it allows you to create massive amounts of diversification, both across markets, asset classes, managers, properties, which all lead uh, to avoiding that single point of failure, right? It gives you tax advantages on passive income, if you're a real estate professional, it gives you tax advantages on active income. Um, you get the opportunity to leverage experts' time, energy, and access to capital to be able to do this stuff. Um, and it creates asymmetric risk to reward, right? The, the risk is lower than the return profile when you compare that to some of these other traditional things. So when you see the writing on the wall and you understand that, that box, they may not have gotten that same message or lesson yet. They may not have gone down this path. So you have to remember that this is an opportunity for you to introduce them to the idea. You know them, you trust them, you like them. They have the best intentions. It could be your wife or husband as well that might have the best intentions on these things as well, but they just might not know or understand it. It's okay, but you have to let their, you have to either decide, am I going to follow their feedback or am I going to trust in what I'm learning myself as well? Because when I'm talking to a financial advisor, I might talk to somebody and they say, I totally get it. I'm uh, you know, a fiduciary, I don't make any money. My job's really to you know, manage the money in the portfolio and I give them advice based on how much their net worth is. Uh, they're paying me a fee. Those people get it. They're always looking for other ways for people to invest because they're not financially tied to the decisions that are being made. But the people whose money is tied to the fact that your money's in, your, in their account it's really going to be difficult for them to say, yes, you should go invest in real estate and take money out of my pocket. Because that's the way, even if they're not thinking about it like that, they're thinking about it like that. And so that's really important. There's CPAs that have no idea about syndication. There's attorneys that have no idea about syndication. How do I know? Because I'm educating them about it every day. I'm talking to people on the phone and they're interested in investing, but they're like, hey, I don't really get it. How does this work? And then they have that aha moment. So it, it's important to have advisors and to have these trusted people and to truly trust in their advice. But you have to understand that if you're going to go to another level, you might need to get some new advisors that are going to help go with you there. That doesn't mean you have to get rid of the people you got. It just means you're going to bring in somebody else who you know, like, and trust, who can coach you and mentor you and guide you down that path to be able to learn these things and apply them as well. Yeah, I love that. It's that fine line because look, the the you never truly arrive on the search for knowledge, right? And so I'm continuing to learn every day. I'm sure you are too. And um, you can be an expert and still be learning every day. And that's where I think sometimes uh, the board uh, or team of advisors, you know, people don't understand that, that they just may not know <laughs> everything there is to know about this unique investment because it's not a public investment. And I think you're spot on with that, uh, with the comment about, <laughs> you know, how, what motivates people, right? And in most cases, the financial advisors who have the accounts there are, are not advising people to cancel their accounts, pull the money out and invest in real estate, even if they understand it, just because mm -hmm. that's self-sabotage to their own portfolio, mm -hmm. their own book of mm -hmm. business. So it's not that they're bad people. They want to do the, the best. And I think a lot of times it's based out of fear. I have a, my best friend, the guy who married me at my weddings at one of the top financial advisors, and he doesn't invest in my deals because he just does what he knows. And so I think there's also that fear of them saying, yeah, this looks like a great idea. I will go ahead and do it if you're a CPA attorney or a financial advisor. And then they invest in the deal sponsor blows it. And then that comes in bat and looks bad on them, right? So you gotta be yeah. careful about who you stick your neck out for. And I think that that's so true for the team of advisors on these weird um, kind of not non-traditional type investments that not a lot of people have exposure to. And that's what's so cool about it is giving people opportunities 
to invest in these things where they can become a real estate investor and get all the amazing benefits, but not do any of the actual work and truly get mailbox money. Yeah. I mean, and look, you guys, majority of you might be in a position where you just learned about this in the last few years, might be this year, might be the last five, 10, 15, 20 years. This has been around for decades. This is not new, but you might only be hearing about it now because it's been really reserved for the richest companies and wealthiest families for generations. This is the way that they've placed their capital. This is the idea behind family offices and placing money into real estate investments. It's been limited to people who have that kind of net worth to have access and really have the relationships because previously, you know, this wasn't something that could really be talked about in any kind of public sphere. It was all backroom cigars and connections at country clubs. So uh, be grateful that there's an opportunity that now we're out there. This is starting to become a little bit more popular. People are learning more about it. There's always going to be uh, horror stories that are going to happen. People are going to make mistakes. People are going to not be qualified, but that's why you want to spend some time up front, getting educated, listening to these shows, diving in with a coach or mentor, you know, diving in with a great sponsor team, um, and really spending that time, really understanding the business. You don't have to know the business, but if you just understand the business, it'll help you make better decisions. And that's one of the things that you don't get when you're investing in the stock market. It's rare that people who are investing really truly understand the business fundamentals of the business they're investing in. And in real estate, it's a fairly simple business. It's not necessarily easy, but it's simple. And you guys can all understand it. Even if you just binge podcasts for a couple months, you're going to learn a lot more than you probably know about what you're investing in elsewhere. Great, Stephen. This has been a very educational episode. I'd like to button it up with one personal question. That's if you had one day left to live, how would you spend it? If I had one day left to live, I would spend it with uh, some of the most important people to me. I would go out and adventure and experience life. And I really honestly try to look at my life every day from a place of, am I, if I was going to die this week, am I happy about the way that I'm spending my time? Is this the thing that uh, am I liking how I'm showing up? Am I liking what I'm focused on? And anytime that I catch myself in a place where that's not in alignment, I, I try to make that shift. I'm not perfect. Doesn't happen all the time, but it's a, it's a really powerful way to think because you really never know, you know, losses around the corner. That's not something to worry or be scared about, but it's something to appreciate that this could be the last moment you have. So appreciate it and, uh, and be able to move forward. Great. Well, you're a great speaker and uh, I love following your outdoor adventures uh, <laughs> and watching all the cool stuff you're doing. And uh, thanks for coming on the show. And how, what's the best uh, way for people to get in contact with you? Well, we just talked about some really powerful things about passive investing. So I encourage you guys, if you want the full guide, we put together this 52 page resource. Even if you just read the first two pages, you're going to totally get clarity on what it is that you want to do even if you're going to go down the active route, you can head over to investormindset.com slash passive. That's investormindset.com slash passive. And you can grab a copy of that. I'm sure you'll include that in the show notes. Um, if you guys grab a copy, you know, you'll be able to learn a lot more about how you can apply some of these same principles in your own life and business. The other thing that I recommend is if you enjoyed this show, definitely check out Investor Mindset podcast on your favorite app. Um, we, we talk about this stuff all the time and I encourage you, uh, to reach out on social media. Let me know that you're listening to this show and just say, hi, just say, Hey, I appreciate that episode. Get connected. It can be a great way. Uh, either me or someone from my team, uh, will help, uh, help take it from there. So it was a pleasure, uh, pleasure serving you guys and look forward to next time. All right. Great. Enjoy the rest of your day. Hey, what's up everybody? It's Mike Sowers, your host of the show. I don't know if you know this, but our company, Commercial Investors Group, is actually the only commercial investing franchise system in the entire world. And we're actually looking for partners in all major US markets. So a lot of people have been asking me about this franchise opportunity. So what I did is I put together a webinar that walks you through everything in full detail. Now, the reality is that this opportunity is only for people who are serious about making this happen for themselves now. And to qualify, you have to be really smart, you have to love crunching the numbers, you have to be very decisive, and you need to have a strong sense of urgency to accomplish your goals and make a real change in your life. So to get registered for this exclusive webinar, just head over to www.crefranchise.com and as a bonus just for attending, I'm gonna throw in a free audio copy of my book as well as some of my coolest deal analyzer tools. That's www.crefranchise.com. We'll see you in there.